name is Emily DePew, and I am a member of the Joel Institute Student Advisory Board, the official group of the Institute, student group of the Institute. Welcome to the Joel Institute of Politics, and thank you for attending today's program, presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. The Joel Institute would like to hear from you today about, about today's program. Please let us know your feedback by contacting us on social media or via email at joelinstitute.ku.edu. To view past programs, visit our online video archive at www.joelinstitute.org. A video of today's presentation will be available on our website soon. We would like to encourage each of you to consider becoming friends of the Joel Institute. Our friends help keep our programs free and open and support archive research and our student activities. Please contact us if you are interested. After the presentation, we will have some time for audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you're able and just ask one brief question. As a reminder, our new exhibit, The League of Wives, Vietnam's POW, MIA, Allies and Advocates is now open in the reading room near the front of Hanson Hall. This interactive exhibit shares the story of a group of courageous women that organized to form the National League of POW MIA Families. There is an information card on your seat today with more information about the exhibit. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. James Wilbanks. Before Dr. James Wilbanks begins, I'd like to remind you that next week we'll be having another Fort or a director series on the last stand of South Vietnam featuring Dr. Wilbanks. I work cheap. Um, okay, I, I was asked to talk about U.S. withdrawal from Vietnam, and this is going to be really the first of two parts, and the second part will be, in fact, next week, where we talk about what happens after we depart in 1973. So the focus today will be on the period 68 to 73, and I start with 68 because it begins with the Tet Offensive. And the Tet Offensive is the watershed event of the war, and it changes everything that went before it. Uh, the, the thrust and, uh, of U.S. policy in Vietnam makes a major change after the Tet Offensive. It was, uh, in a very real sense, at the tactical and operational level, and a victory for the United States and the other allies. However, strategically and psychologically, it was a victory for the other side. Uh, this quote here from General Tran Do, who commanded the troops, the North Vietnamese troops at the Battle of Way in 68, uh, speaks to <coughs> the uh, outcome of the Tet Offensive. And the Tet Offensive had a tremendous impact both on the military, but more importantly, on the political situation. Johnson decides not to run for re-election. That results in a very contentious uh, Democratic National Convention in Chicago where Humphrey wins the Democratic nomination. And of course, his problem is he was Johnson's vice president and he is now have to defend the policy which has become so unpopular around the country. At the Republican National Convention in Miami, Nixon wins the nomination, picks Ferrero T. Agnew as his running mate, hints that he has a secret plan to end the war and talks about peace with honor. Um, there really is no secret plan. There are some amorphous ideas about how to bring this thing to a conclusion. Um, but what will happen after he ekes out a narrow win is that he's going to have to find out, he's going to have to discern a way to, br to meet his election promise and achieve peace with honor. This is a situation in early 69 when Johnson, uh, I'm sorry, Nixon begins to, uh, or is inaugurated. The anti-war movement is gaining in velocity and, and amplitude. There is a waning support for the war, even among the hawks, uh, because this looks like a bloody stalemate that's just going to go on forever with no particular end in sight. At the same time, you've got a widening credibility gap, not the least of which is caused by comments in the late 67 about a light at the end of the tunnel by General Westmoreland, only to have the Tet Offensive light off on 31 January with the, the violence 
the very visible violence that's played in uh, the homes of all Americans on the 530 News on the three networks that exist at that time. South Vietnamese government itself is still beset by corruption, is still weak, and at this particular point we have over a half a million troops in Vietnam. And the high point actually is April 69, not 1968. So the problem beset by this situation is how to go about ending the war. So to start this process, Nixon issues, actually Kissinger issues, National Security Study Memorandum 1, which is known as the 29 questions. And the 29 questions are sent out to every part of the U.S. government that has anything to do with the war in Vietnam. And these 29 questions are basically built around the central question is how to go forward in Vietnam in terms of U.S. policy. It is an attempt to find some sort of consensus within the Nixon administration about how to proceed. It achieves absolutely no consensus whatsoever. The only consensus, or close to consensus, is that everyone who responds except the military says that the South Vietnamese government and its armed forces will never be able to handle both the BC and the North Vietnamese after we're gone. And based upon that finding, then Kissinger and Nixon devolve a, uh, develop a, a strategy that is meant to do just exactly that, turn the war over to the South Vietnamese and depart despite the fact that everyone says they'll never be able to handle the remaining BC from uh, the Tet Offensive, the survivors, and the North Vietnamese Army. But there is this idea that we're going to end the war one way or the other. But as Kissinger says in his memoir, Nixon could not afford just to walk away. Because we had allies around the world, and if we walked away in Vietnam, then our allies in NATO, arguably more important than what's going on in Southeast Asia, would perhaps see us waver, and that would have a, a tremendously negative impact on NATO and our other alliances. So, over a, a fairly short period of time, they come up with a strategy, peace with honor. And you can really kind of break it down into these four efforts. Vietnamization and the troop withdrawals are announced at the Midway Conference in June of 69. The first thing is that Nixon announces we will begin to withdraw troops. A brigade from the 9th Infantry Division will depart in August 1969. And then there would be 15 increments that followed that initial brigade departure. Each one of them supposedly predicated on what's going on in the battlefield and the progress of the South Vietnamese in terms of accepting the battle, responsibility for the battle. What really happened is once they started, they achieved a momentum of their own. These increments continue even during 1972 when the country is on the ropes. So I am fighting at Anlock and 65 miles away people are getting on an airplane and leaving Vietnam. That's somewhat demoralizing if you're not on the flight manifest. <laughs> Kissinger says that the troop withdrawals were like peanuts. You couldn't eat just one. So what happens is that these will be regularized after the first year and a half. So if you're sitting in, in, in Hanoi, you can take a calendar and, and really program these out. And we would probably have been gone in mid-73 no matter what happened. So uh, that's going to be a particular problem for Kissinger. Because ultimately he will begin secret negotiations outside of Paris with laid up toe when the public peace talks, they spend a year talking about the shape of the table. It's going absolutely nowhere. The problem for Kissinger is the main thing he has to offer is already being announced every three months, and that's the troop withdrawals. So we're sending him to play poker. He arrives at the table, pushes all his chips there, and says, let's play. So there's really nothing to uh, use as lever or leverage with the North Vietnamese. The other part of the effort would be pacification, the other war, winning the hearts and minds. And this is an effort that's been going on since our earliest days in Vietnam. Uh, it, it got a, a shot in the arm with the establishment of Cords in 19, 1967. And essentially what you have are <coughs> province teams advising the South Vietnamese in each of the 44 provinces. And they're there to, number one, secure the people, and number two, spread the influence of the Saigon government. 
And pacification is beginning to make some inroads because what happened during the Tet Offensive is the other side lost 40,000 troops. That's a, that's a conservative number. Many of those were Viet Cong. So what that meant is after the Tet Offensive, the Viet Cong in many places were not militarily significant. I never saw a Viet Cong in a year. They were still around in some places, but from 60, early 69 on, most of the fighting was done by the North Vietnamese Army, or more correctly, the PAVN. So that pacification effort is going to continue even as Kissinger is shuttling back and forth to Paris. The real focus is on Vietnamization, which has as its objective turned the war over to the South Vietnamese forces as the U.S. Department. And it really is broken down into those parts that you see there. A couple of them are fairly easy. Increase the size of the Republic of Vietnam Armed Forces, you just have a mass draft call by the South Vietnamese government. Equipment and force modernization, we can do some logistics and we turn the hose on South Vietnam. We give them F-5 fighters, M-48 tanks, uh, modern weapon systems down to the militia level. We run some programs, partnership with U.S. units in the field. And the idea there was that a South Vietnamese unit would operate with a U.S. unit and at some particular time, it would be determined that that South Vietnamese unit was capable of taking on the area of operation and the U.S. unit then would pull out. That was the idea in theory. But once these troop increments began, they continued almost like clockwork. So it really didn't matter if the South Vietnamese were ready to take over that unit was leaving if they were on a manifest. The other idea was to improve the advisory effort. I'll talk about that in just a bit. The driving force behind Vietnamization is Melbourne Laird, the Secretary of Defense. And these are the phases that have been drawn out for the program. And the idea is that, as we would say today, increase the capacity of the South Vietnamese Armed Forces so that they can assume responsibility for the area of operation as we concurrently reduce the American footprint. If you use the language you'll use here, we stand down as they stand up. That's the idea anyway. In practice, and Jerry Friedheim was one of Laird's advisors, he said in his memoir that Laird was more interested in ending the war than winning it. So that will, he will be continually pushing Kissinger and Nixon to increase the number of troops being withdrawn as quickly as he can. The individuals charged with executing this in country were General Abrams, Comus McVie in the upper right hand, Ambassador uh, Bunker, lower left, and Ambassador Colby, who was in charge of the pacification effort at this particular point. To make sure that these guys understood, a new mission was issued to Comus McVie on 15 August 69. And it moved from the normal military kind of defeat the enemy and forces withdrawal to provide maximum assistance to strengthen the armed forces of the Republic of Vietnam reduce the flow of supplies, and not stated, but in the mission statement, not shown here, is to transfer responsibility over to the South Vietnamese forces as U.S. forces are continuing to be withdrawn. So here's the problem then for Comus McVie, General Abrams. You have to hold off the enemy because the enemy always gets a vote. While you provide time for pacification and Vietnamization to work, but at the same time, those troops you need for the first two bullets are being withdrawn in chunks of 15 to 25 to 35,000 apiece, almost every 90 days. So this is, a, this is an imponderable almost for General Abrams. It, it's almost a, 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 a mission that is too difficult to achieve given those parameters. Nevertheless, he is a good soldier and he, he carries on. Um, but we still have problems within the Army. And these problems have beset the South Vietnamese Armed Forces since our earliest involvement there, dating all the way back to 1950. Poor leadership, lack of aggressiveness, corruption, politics. Many of the general officers got their jobs because of their, their friendship or relationship with whoever happens to be in power at that particular time. And of course, if you've been fighting since, since 1956 against what becomes the Viet Cong, many of your best leaders are killed in the fighting. And this now, now it's, it's 1969. 
So there are problems with the army. So it becomes very difficult to build a viable force who can take on the VC and the North Vietnamese who gave us all that we could handle when we are involved at the height of the war. Part of the answer is to improve the advisory effort. We had had advisors there since 19, actually 1950, although when the French were there, we weren't advising anybody, we were really transferring property and equipment. Once U.S. forces began to arrive in the March of 65, and it became the, the big unit war, the advisory effort became a sideshow. That doesn't mean that there weren't good people that were advisors, it just means in terms of resourcing and priority and emphasis, it was not on the advisory effort. So that meant that if you were a captain and you went to Vietnam, you wanted to be a company commander in 112 Cav. You did not want to be a district, assistant district senior advisor. At this particular juncture, certainly as the U.S. troops are withdrawn, the advisory effort becomes the only game in town. So when I arrive in 1971, from a high of 77 infantry battalions, there are four left, U.S. So it's pretty clear that if I'm going to, as an infantry officer, go to the field, I'm going to be an advisor. So they sent me to Fort Bragg for six weeks to the Military Advisor Training Assistance course, which included some advisor techniques, um, some on Vietnamese culture, a little bit of language, and then they sent me for 11 weeks to Vietnamese language school to El Paso, Texas, because only the Army would send you to El Paso to learn Vietnamese. <laughs> and I would tell you I retained a lot of it. I can probably order a machine gun in the right 7-Eleven in South Houston, and that's about it. <laughs> But there was, there was a movement, certainly among the field grade officers. I was just a captain, so, I, you know, pretty low level. Among the field grade officers, the idea was, if you had somebody who'd been a battalion commander in the 25th U.S., then you send them back to work with the 25th Arvin, which was working the same area. So at least he had been in the same train. He knew the units he was going to, he was going to advise. And at the senior levels, that made a lot of difference, I think. Down at, down at the grunt level, it was just, you know, my qualification to be an advisor, I was 1542 light infantryman who could fog a mirror. And that was about the extent of it. So that's how I ended up being an advisor. The problem for all this is the war continues. The other side gets a vote, and their vote is to continue the war. So there is a mini tet in 69. The infamous Battle of Hamburger Hill, I only say infamous, not because it was infamous for who, those who fought there, but because of the impact it had in the U.S. Congress. 1969 was the second highest annual total of KIA for the war. So decidedly, the war is not over. So you've got to think about what Abrams has been charged to do. And that is build capacity among the South Vietnamese, hold off the, the North Vietnamese, and oh, by the way, you're losing 25 to 35,000 a chunk about every 90 days while the war continues. So he makes a decision in 1970 that in order to provide some cover and a little bit of breathing space here for the Arvin, and while U.S. forces are still on the ground, he will launch an incursion into Cambodia. Launched on 30 April 1970, 80,000 U.S. and South Vietnamese troops on a limited incursion to strike at the central office for South Vietnam, which control the enemy forces in the, second, the, the southern half of Vietnam. And the base areas in the Parrot's Beak and the Fish Hook, this area here and here. And those were traditional sanctuaries for the VC and the North Vietnamese. So when the U.S. units, at the height of their involvement, would get into a large contact with them, the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong would do their very best to get across the border into Cambodia because Johnson had said he had limited, uh, no U.S. forces were to cross the border into Cambodia or Laos or across the DMZ. Nixon believes that he needs to go in there and take out those staging areas, those base areas, in order to provide more time for Vietnamization to work. Militarily, it makes sense. Politically, it results in a firestorm. Four are killed by the, by the National Guard at Kent State. There are mass marches around the country 
On 10 May, two students are killed by the state police in Jackson State, and 500 campuses are in total uproar to include this one here. It results in a flurry of legislation, or at least attempts, in Congress to limit the authority and the capability of the president to launch those kinds of operations outside of Vietnam. So by this time, you have a full-throated roar going on from the anti-war movement against Nixon. And you have a continual litany of various organizations who are having the moratorium, the march against Washington. He goes on TV in November and makes an appeal to the silent majority. Uh, that does get some support from a large number of Americans, but it really doesn't dampen the anti-war movement. So in, in, a, in a real sense, Cambodia, despite the political furor, the incursion worked very well because the troops who went in there destroyed just an unbelievable amount of war material. Rockets, artillery, vehicles, and probably knocked any plans off to invade South Vietnam for at least a year. It would take them that long to rebuild those forces. So with that idea, <coughs> Nixon gets with President Tu and says, really what we need to do is we need to launch a similar operation in 1971 into Laos. The problem for Nixon at this particular point is that legislation has been passed that precludes any American boots on the ground in Laos or Cambodia. So uh, this is going to be a South Vietnamese operation. And the idea is to basically go into this area here, attack along Highway 9 to Japan, taking out major base areas along this highway. And the idea was to do the same thing that you had done in Cambodia. We will support it by fixed wing and rotary wing aircraft and artillery firing from inside the border of, of uh, South Vietnam. It initially goes reasonably well for about a week. And, and what you have here is a very interesting operation. You have an armored thrust along the highway and then you have airborne and, and light infantry doing air mobile assaults on the high ground north of the river and the high ground south of the river. President Tu gets very worried, and he has an election coming up. So he tells the Corps Commander General Lamb, don't be too aggressive. And that translates pretty quickly to stop. And what happens, you've now got these guys strung out on a one-lane road where they're having to fill shell holes as they go. And slow down translates to stop, and the North Vietnamese respond by sending two divisions down from the north and two up from the south. And what results then is a pitched battle for about a month. Just to give you an idea of the level of combat, we lose 107 helicopters in less than a month. Uh, at, at some particular point, President Tu, in order to save face, declares victory when uh, uh, a battalion makes it to Chapone, and then they begin the withdrawal. And the withdrawal is a bloody withdrawal. It is a fight for their own lives to get back into Vietnam. They make it back into Vietnam. <clears throat> Nixon goes on TV on 7 April and says that Vietnamization has succeeded. Where the actual truth was this had been a debacle. The Army sustained 1,500 killed in action. We lost 65 helicopter crewmen. 42 were missing. A total of 107 helicopters, as I mentioned, and 618 others damaged, some of them so badly they never flew again. So this was not a victory for the Army. It did, the operation did inflict a, quite a bit of damage on the North Vietnamese, but primarily that was done by U.S. TAC Air and B-52s. So by the end of 71, you've got about 100,000 troops left in the country. The American troop morale is down because once you start pulling these troops out, you begin to ask yourself, if you're a, a, a young lad out in the bush, who wants to be the last guy killed in Vietnam? And the answer usually comes back, not me. So as you might suspect, the morale of particularly those in the field is not good. Meanwhile, the advisory effort continues. The South Vietnamese spend the rest of 71 trying to recover from Lam Son. 
And it was pretty clear, despite what Nixon may have said, the Arvin realized they had been defeated in Laos. And it was such a situation that they left many of their bodies there, which in that culture is, weighs heavily on the families and their, their friends. Meanwhile, North Vietnam has decided that there are enough U.S. troops gone that it might be time to really take the war to the South Vietnamese. And so they will decide to launch a new offensive. And the idea is to defeat the South Vietnamese armed forces, topple Saigon if possible, at least destabilize the government, show Vietnamization and pacification as being bankrupt, and then fracture the U.S. and South Vietnamese resolve. And at the very worst, they would position themselves for any follow-on negotiations, because they, they prosecuted this concept called Don Bu Don, which basically means fighting while talking. So they, all the time that they're talking to Kissinger, the fighting continues on the battlefield. <coughs> so they come up with a Nguyen Way campaign. This is a massive invasion of South Vietnam by 14 divisions and 26 separate regiments. This is every division in the North Vietnamese Army, less two. One stays in North Vietnam to secure North Vietnam, and the other continues to occupy Laos and working with a path at Laos. Everything else comes south. 120 to 150,000 troops, depending on who you believe. It starts on Good Friday, 1972, 31 March, with an attack across the DMC against Military Region 1, the old I Corps tactical zone, the northernmost part of South Vietnam. Followed closely by, by, thereafter by an attack in Binh Long Province, which is only 65 miles away from Saigon. And almost simultaneously, another attack at Kantum and Pleiku in the Central Highlands. This is a massive conventional attack. Wilbank's first rule of counter guerrilla operations, if they're driving tanks, they ain't guerrillas. And these guys are driving tanks. They've got the most modern Soviet equipment. They have things like AT-3 AT Sagger anti-tank missiles, SA-7 shoulder-fired red-eye-like anti-aircraft missiles, uh, T-54s, Chinese Type 59s, uh, stuff, many of the stuff had never before been seen in, in South Vietnam. Nixon responds in a fairly strong way. He increases the air assets in theater, launches Linebacker One, which is the bombing of North Vietnam, and mines Haiphong Harbor under Operation Pocket Money. He increases the Seventh Fleet, almost doubles it, and where you normally had two carriers on station in the South China Sea, you have six by the time the Easter Offensive is over, each of them carrying over 100 combat aircraft. The fighting goes on up until September, and it is actually an analog. It was closer to World War I than anything else that had happened in Vietnam because essentially you had 4,500 Arvins surrounded by 3,500 uh, North Vietnamese. And this goes on from the 5th of April and up until September. We um, can talk about the Q&A in more detail if you like. The outcome of the Easter Offensive by the end of 72 is that Khantum has held against a multi-division attack. Anlock is held. Quang Tri falls in May and is recaptured in September. So in a very real sense, the South Vietnamese have won a great victory here. And it was a very near thing in each of these locations. Nevertheless, Nixon declares that Vietnamization has proved itself. And in one sense, he's right. But the unstated thing here is that with massive amounts of air power, the Arvin were able to stand against the North Vietnamese. Just at Anlock alone, where I was, 247 B-52 missions and 9,000 TAC air sorties between March and the end of July. And there is very little doubt in the minds of anybody who participated in this that the Arvin would not have survived without this massive influx of U.S. air power and other support. The results of the Easter Offensive written large. The invasion was defeated. Arvin morale is understandably high. Casualties were high. My regiment started out with 1,100. We ended up with 350. 
The NVA lost a tremendous amount of casualties. They lost about 50% of their tanks and heavy artillery. But at the end, both sides were so exhausted that the North Vietnamese remnants, for instance, of the three divisions of ANLOC were basically just there in the rubber because neither side had the capability to destroy the other side. So meanwhile, the peace talks have been going on. And Kissinger says that when at the height of the invasion, when it looked like South Vietnam was going to fall any minute, that Le Duc Tho and the other negotiators read him the papers, the, the Paris papers basically saying South Vietnam cannot survive another 24 hours. And as you might suspect, they weren't too amenable then to any kind of negotiations because they were already getting what they wanted. But by the end of July, mid-August, it is pretty clear that the invasion has failed. As I said, by that point, uh, certainly shortly thereafter, uh, Quang Tri will be recaptured. So the North Vietnamese become more amenable at that point. One of the sticking points all along in the t peace talks was they refused to acknowledge the, uh, the legitimacy of the Saigon government, the two government in Saigon. On 14 August, there's a major change, and I think this is because it's pretty clear the invasion has not, has not succeeded. And they say, okay, we'll acknowledge the Saigon government. And then uh, Le Duc Tho and Kissinger then will return to their, their respective homes for consultation. And this is kind of a, this is that idea of shuttle diplomacy on both sides. On 26 September, the North Vietnamese proposed a provisional government of national accord, which sounds a lot like a coalition government to President Tu. Haig goes to Saigon, General Haig, uh, Kissinger's advisor, to meet with President Tu to convince him that this is a good deal. It's going to be a hard sell. On 21 October, in an attempt to up the ante, North Vietnam says we will take a ceasefire in place. That's really n not much of a, co a, of a concession because we had gone in in 69 initially asking for a mutual withdrawal. U.S. troops withdraw, North Vietnamese troops go north of the DMZ. And it becomes pretty clear, if you look at the documentation doing the research, you see that tracking along is always an objective and then one day it just drops off. It's no longer there. And, and reading Kissinger, and you kind of have to read between the lines, is that they determined that the other side was not going to withdraw from Vietnam uh, if they couldn't be made to do so. And it was really, there's no leverage here. Because Kissinger can't say, I'll pull my troops out if you pull your troops out because they're already getting on airplanes and leaving. President Tu sees this as a surrender and rejects the proposed accord. Nixon, trying to, to entice the North Vietnamese, said, orders the end of bombing north of the 20th parallel. President Tu renounces publicly the ceasefire agreement and says it is essentially a surrender document. For some unknown reason, Kissinger announces that peace is at hand, which enrages Nixon. Peace is decidedly not at hand. Two, realizes that this is a document that might be good, it'd be great for North Vietnam, and it might be great for the United States, but it's not gonna be great for South Vietnam. Meanwhile, Swan Thuy, who is one of the negotiators of Le Duc Tho, charges that the U.S. really isn't serious and announces that its forces will continue fighting on all fronts unless an, an agreement is reached forthwith. Two, from his perspective, submits 69 amendments to the draft agreement. At this particular point, Nixon, and I, I will use his language as a direct quote, hopefully not to offend anybody, the Vietnamese are all shits, North, North, North Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, all of them. But he feels compelled then to take those 69 amendments back to the North Vietnamese in Paris, and at that point, by the end of November, the talks have bogged down. They pick up again on 4 December, but on 13 December, there is an impasse, and the North Vietnamese negotiators say they must return to Hanoi. An enraged Nixon says that we will bomb them back to the negotiating table. And he tells the chairman of the Joint Chief, Admiral Moore, 
I don't want any more of this crap about the fact that we couldn't hit this target or that one. Now is your chance to win the war. Do it. And oh, by the way, I hold you personally responsible. That results in Operation Linebacker 2, 18 to 29 December. Targeted primarily against Hanoi and Haiphong, and the objective was to force North Vietnam back to the negotiating table. But there is a line of thought that says maybe part of the reason for Operation Linebacker 2 was to send a message not to North Vietnam, but to South Vietnam, to President Tu. Basically saying, we will be there like we were in 72, sign the peace accord, and if they violate it, we'll be there just like we were in, in Linebacker 2. 26 December, North Vietnam agrees to return to the talks. After the war, several of the senior leaders in North Vietnam admit that they were pretty much on the ropes at that point. In fact, they are 11 days of bombing. After about day six, they are out of missiles. So when the bombers go up there, none of the missiles come up. Nevertheless, on 29 December, Linebacker 2 is terminated. The results are we lose 26 aircraft. There are about 1,600 killed in Hanoi and about 1,500, as I remember, in Haiphong. So now we are negotiating in, in earnest. Kitchener and Lady Ducteau conduct new talks in Paris, but I must tell you that the agreement that they come up with is still exactly the same one that they had agreed to before the bombing in December. And therein lies the whole line of thought that this was sending a message to South Vietnam, not North Vietnam. At one particular point, Nixon tells two, sign the agreement or we'll sign it without you. And the result of the Paris Peace Accords. A ceasefire in place, which means you own the ground where you sit. The U.S. would cease all military operations against the Democratic Republic of Vietnam and would draw all its troops within 60 days. POWs on both sides or on all sides would be repatriated and then there was uh, a reparations clause. The key thing here, particularly from a South Vietnamese standpoint, is it made no mention of the remnants of those forces who came south on Good Friday and are now occupying land inside South Vietnam. So that's sort of like you think what would happen, what happened in Korea. You have an armistice, North Koreans stay above the 38th parallel, we stay south. So this is tantamount to signing the armistice in Korea and leaving 100,000 North, North Koreans in South, Vietnam, in South Korea. And it would work about as well as that would work, I think. Now this is, map's a little bit misleading here when you see, for instance, uh, this area right here around Anlock and Ben Long, they are occupying that, but it doesn't mean they're in any force, with any force, because those three divisions have been decimated. But the remnants are still there. So what will happen when we stop bombing the Ho Chi Minh Trail, over the course of the next year, they'll build those forces back up to 100%. And those are the forces that will be victorious in 75, and we'll talk more about that next time. So, 27 February, the last of the American POWs are released. Um, actually, the last ones are, are released uh, just across the border from Cambodia. Some of those who were captured in Analog were, are uh, locked in, pretty close to where I was. Last U.S. unit was the 1st Aviation Brigade, furls its colors and leaves, and on 29 March, U.S. Military Assistance Command Vietnam is deactivated. And for the United States, the war is over. For the South Vietnamese, it decidedly is not. And we'll talk about that on 25 May if you want to come back. So I'll be happy to answer any questions you have at this time. Yeah, Tom. But she's got a mic. They go crazy if you don't use the mic. Uh, you said that uh, you participated in the uh, Vietnamese uh, effort yourself. And uh, as someone who uh, is in a position to know about this, uh, I wondered if the U.S. were missing some big thing uh, and could have made the Vietnamization effort more successful, or was it just inherently an intractable problem? Well, I think the problem was that Vietnamization, the, the priority, was too late. It doesn't really become a priority until 70 or 71. And frankly, from when the U.S. units began to arrive in 65, that's a, that's a subsidiary effort. And so, you know, by, by 69 or 70, 
you're trying to build a force that maybe you should have started in 65 or 64. And uh, interestingly enough, the, the South Vietnamese do pretty well in 73 on their own. But by mid-74, they're beginning to run out of things, and then panic sets in, and once it does, it's, uh, it runs through South Vietnam like wildfire. And then once the North Vietnamese start their final, it's not an invasion, they're already in the South, so you can't invade something you already are, where you are already located. South Vietnam will fall in 55 days. Yes, sir. Would there have been any military advantage uh, to the U.S. and South Vietnamese side if Haiphong Harbor had been mined and or blockaded uh, earlier? Sure. In fact, the military is advising that all along, and Johnson is saying absolutely not. You're not going to do that. And he will actually say, you know, my... He says, in fact, on one video I saw, his nightmare was that some Navy pilot from Johnson City, Texas, would drop a bomb down the funnel of a Soviet ship and start World War III. And so Haiphong Harbor was off limits, the DMZ was off limits, Laos and Cambodia were off limits. And certain areas of North Vietnam were off limits, and of course where they moved their MiG bases were where they knew we weren't going to drop bombs because of political limitations. But everything they used in, in 72 came through the port of Haiphong or on the railroad from China down from Kaobang. I mean, they, they don't make T-54s in Vietnam. They might now, but they didn't then. They didn't make any of that stuff. It was all Chinese, Soviet, and Warsaw Pact. Other questions? Yes, sir. What similarities do you see between Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia then, and Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran today? Do you want me to answer that in five minutes, or do I have, <laughs> have a week? Well, I think the advisory, there are some similarities, because what you're trying to do is build capacity in a, in a force that, that needs modernization. Um, if there's anything going for them in both of those places is there's not the equivalent of the North Vietnamese Army. And that, that's sort of, therein lies the, one of the, the big arguments, and I think it's a false dichotomy, that Vietnam, the Vietnam War was either counterinsurgency or it was a conventional war. And the answer is yes. It was both. You had to contend with the guerrillas, but you also had to contend with guys who were had the most modern equipment and were well trained, and that was the problem. So, in one sense, they don't have to contend with that, at least in Afghanistan. But it doesn't seem to be making a lot of difference because the, the problem is you have to try to build those forces. It's not for lack of effort. We've been trying to do it for how many years now? Yes, sir. Larry. What's your opinion? The last part of your question? What's your opinion of William Johnson as a wartime president? Well, I think he makes a conscious decision to fight the war on the cheap, or at least attempt to, and it's impossible to do that. And there are, there are some decisions that you can fault a man for. One is deciding not to be candid with the American public. And that's a conscious decision. Because he, you know, he's a New Deal Democrat. His focus is on domestic policy the Great Society programs, and he doesn't want this war to impact those. And consequently, he makes decisions like to rely on the draft rather than mobilize the reserves and the National Guard. Because he thought, wrongly as it turns out, that there would be less political impact by going by the draft rather than, than uh, mobiliz mobilizing reserve components. It turned out to be a major mistake. And the problem here is that he imposes limited war on our efforts in Southeast Asia, and the other side's fighting a total war. So here's your orders, Westmoreland. I would like you not to go into Cambodia, not to go into Laos, not to cross the DMZ, and not to bomb ha uh, Haiphong Harbor. Now go win the war. And really what he's saying is, go, don't lose the war. <laughs>
which are two different things. And the other side's all in. It's a total war. You know, and you got guys who say, you know, the death of 10 is a tragedy, the death of 10,000 is a step along the way to re realizing the revolution. You know, McNamara said, we didn't think they were, we dealt with them like they were rational people. Well, they were rational, based on their definition of rationality, not, not McNamara's. And they keep looking for this mythical, mythical crossover point. It, it proved to be mythical, because the other side was gonna take as many casualties as they had to in order to realize the revolution. And we just never really understood that. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, he made the determination he didn't have enough troops to do that. The problem was that you had to deal with the guerrillas, but you also had to deal with the Pavan, the main force guys. And he made the decision. And in fact, he says, you can, you can worry about the termites who'll tear the house down in some time, some, some time in the future, or you can worry about the bully boys who will tear the house down today with crowbars. And he made the determination the North Vietnamese were the guys with the crowbars. And the problem was you had to deal with both. You know, we have the, the coinistas who say it was always first, last, and always, you know, a guerrilla, and a counterinsurgency. Well, once again, if they're driving tanks, I'm not really worried about the guerrillas in, in black pajamas. The guy driving the tank with a 100 millimeter gun's got my attention. Yes, please. I understand that you uh, have been collaborating with Ken Burns on the uh, documentary that's going to come out this fall, and I just wonder if you could update us a little bit if you've had any, you know, anything okay, you could tell it, us about that. Thank it you. It will be out. I think the date is September the eighth, give or take a day or two. If I'm, I might be wrong, um, I believe it's currently ten parts. They're vigorously. I don't know if marketing is the right word or not, but they're all going all over the country right now, talking about it at places like the OBJ Library and the Nixon Library, what have you. Uh, it's been a almost four year effort. And there have been about, I don't there must be 25 advisors from every particular political perspective and background as you could, you might imagine. So they have guys like me who fought there. They have guys like me who fought there and came back and joined the Vietnam Veterans Against the War. They have war protesters, they have, they have uh, parents. Uh, I think that they endeavored very diligently to be objective and to tell the story as it happened. I don't think there's a political stance. Uh, I know that he's worried about it. I've heard him say that a lot of people won't like it, particularly those who don't watch it. Um, we'll wait and see. I know that uh, the rollout in Kansas City will be the first week in September. He and uh, Lynn Novick, who's his associate uh, producer, are coming to Leavenworth to talk to the students, and then we're going to have a couple of programs in Kansas City. Yes, sir. Uh, were the North Vietnamese ever close to exhausting the, their resources in terms of the number of troops they could put in the field? Yes, yes. And there have been acknowledgments by several senior North Vietnamese officials who have said, certainly in 72, in December 72, they were close to breaking. And uh, they had basically rolled the dice in 72. When you send everything but two divisions in your army south, and they're not successful in achieving your objectives, then you're in trouble. But it's irrelevant. Despite the fact the South Vietnamese held, it turns out to be irrelevant in the long run. Yeah. Another question. <clears throat> I was there earlier than you. I was with the 1st Infantry Division. I was around Anlock, Quang Loi, and a little bit further south. I had no doubt 
1967 that we were winning the war, at least it appeared to me, I was just a captain, but it appeared to me that we were winning the war, but whenever we'd have a major confrontation, we could see them going back up to the fish hook. Sure. And once they got in there, it was King's X. Had we done earlier what Nixon did in 1970 and gone in there, I know it's speculation, but what's your opinion? It, it seems to me that, that that was so frustrating for us to see him go back there and we couldn't do anything about well, it. Well, sure. I mean, and, uh, if you had a contact and the other side starting getting the fore end of it, they, they hot-footed it for Cambodia and you couldn't follow them. Um, the results of not being able to go in there again is between 1970, April 1970, when you go in, in the, the incursion, and 1972, they take all of those units and build them up to 100%, and they come across its new Cambodia with 80 tanks. And they are able to do that because we can't cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. All that stuff is streaming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and everything that was destroyed in 70 is now replaced. And that was always the problem. If you can't cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail, this war goes on till you get tired. Because they can, they can sustain it forever, as long as they're being supported by the Soviet Union and, and the PRC. Well, you could have, if, 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 if you didn't have Johnson in the White House who said you're not going to do it. If you have Johnson in the White House who says we're not going to do it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I don't, I don't disagree with you. Westmoreland had a plan called El Paso, which was to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail along Highway 9 in Laos, which looks a lot like Lam San 719. And Johnson said, basically, you know, are you out of your mind? That will start World War III. Because he's worried about a Chinese-like reaction akin to 1950 in, in North Korea. And that that basically, and he says, you know, I can't win this war because if I win it, I may start World War III. Other questions or comments? Uh, the uh, North Vietnamese uh, sometimes like to present themselves as uh, strategic geniuses uh, uh, through all this, uh, but I wanted to ask if uh, if uh, there were any major strategic uh, mistakes that the North uh, Vietnamese made in these years? Well, I think the major mistake they made was launching the 72 offensive. If you looked at the calendar, by 72, we've been reducing troops about every 30 days since August 69. If you waited us out, we'd be gone by mid-73 anyway. We're down to 100,000 by January 72. There's more than a little hubris involved there. They decide to launch that attack rather than wait until we're gone because they make a, a conscious decision to hang the defeat on South Vietnam while U.S. forces are still in place. That's clearly documented. Yes, sir. Was there intelligence that uh, showed that the Chinese were uh, organizing and uh, supplying themselves to uh, launch a, uh, a, a an attack with the North Vietnamese, or was that just not? No, I think basically it'd been transmitted through a number of channels to Johnson early on that, you know, don't get adventuresome and come across and attack North Vietnam directly. We won't respond to that very well. Because number one, they shared a border with them. The whole northern border of, of North Vietnam is shared with the Chinese, which they attack across in 79, but that's another story altogether. Other comments? If not, thank you for coming.